So this is some kind of a potential energy. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what it is. U versus X. And I tell you, I will tell you that this is the total energy. The first thing I want to know is can the particle be here? Because you see, if E equals K plus U, then K equals E minus U. So here's E minus U. So here, E minus U is positive because E is bigger than U. Here, E minus U is negative, right? And can kinetic energy be negative? No. So the particle cannot be found in the region where kinetic energy is negative. It cannot be found in the region where potential energy is greater than the total energy. Now, I told you that you can always shift potential energy up and down. Well, if you add a constant to the potential energy, you must add the same constant to the total energy, right? So yes, you can always add a constant to a potential energy, any constant, but that means E must also get the same constant, right? So you're just shifting the whole pattern. So these are classically forbidden regions, and this one too. Because here, potential energy is bigger than total energy, which means kinetic energy is negative. Well, 1 half mv squared cannot be negative in classical mechanics. It means you would have an imaginary velocity as total nonsense. So particle cannot be there. There are other, also two very important points right here. These are called turning points, okay? Turning points. Why are they called turning points? They're called turning points because E equals U there. So kinetic energy equals there, zero there. Okay. How do I know that particle doesn't just stop and stay there? Because the force is in general non-zero there. Right? So here, even though the kinetic energy is zero at this, at, this left, at this turning point on the right, you see that when the particle gets there, it experiences a force that pushes a particle back. And when a particle gets to this turning point, it will experience a force, you see negative slope, positive force, that pushes a particle back, right? So that's why these things are generally not stopping points, but turning points. Because although the kinetic energy is zero at these turning points, the force is generally non-zero unless the slope is also zero. But generally, it's not. OK, so just looking at this potential energy graph, we see several things. We see that the particle will not be outside of those turning points. The particle will stop at those turning points instantaneously and turn away. We also see that particle will not stop anywhere else. Because anywhere else, in between the turning points, it has a finite budget of kinetic energy. Okay, so E equals my, uh, E minus U is kinetic energy, right? So you can think of this kinetic energy budget. It runs out of that budget at the turning points, but it goes right back. It turns right back and it starts gaining kinetic energy. But here, kinetic energy is, is positive. So a particle will not stop anywhere between the two turning points. And so just by looking at this graph, we see, aha, this is an oscillatory motion. The particle stops, stops here for an instant, and then immediately turns back. And then it goes back, goes back, it stops here for an instant, it immediately turns back, it goes back, it cannot stop, it cannot stop, boom, until it reaches this point, it stops for an instant, experiences a force, it turns back, cannot stop, cannot stop, cannot stop, cannot stop, boom, it reaches this turning point for an instant, there's a force back, turn back. So you get an oscillatory motion. Of course, the motion is actually in one dimension, right? The potential energy graph as a function of 
uh, position is depicted, but the actual, but the, the particle, what the particle will do is it will shuttle back and forth like that. So the motion will look like, like that. But there is more, there's a lot more. I can ask you, where does the particle experience zero force? Well, that's where the slope is zero. So there's a zero force here. Okay, I can ask you, where is it going to be accelerating or decelerating more rapidly? Just by looking at this graph, you know, you have the intuition, you know that, uh, well, it stops here uh, at the left turning point and it experiences no acceleration at the bottom. So it must decelerate to zero from this point to the left turning here. Let me, it must decelerate to zero all the way from this, uh, this point, all the way to this turning point within this region of space. Whereas on the right, it has to decelerate as, as, it, as the particle is going to the right, as it's passing the, the zero force point, approaching the turning point, it will also slow down. It's losing its kinetic energy, but it's losing that kinetic energy over a, lower, a larger, uh, larger distance. And so intuitively you understand that it will be decelerating more gently. And vice versa, as it's going from turning point to this bottom of the potential energy, it will be accelerating more gently here than here, right? So the potential energy graph also tells you about how quickly the particle is accelerating and decelerating. So there is a tremendous amount of information that you can read off from the potential energy graph. Now, when I teach mechanics, I haven't done it in a while, but when I teach mechanics, I go through all these things and students begin to appreciate that potential energy is a very physical, very intuitive thing. It's a lot easier than force because force is a vector, right? So you can see where the particle stops, where it cannot be, where it's gonna be accelerating faster, where it has zero acceleration. Uh, you can visualize the motion. Um, and also imagine that the particle is staying here. Let's say it has zero energy and I want to get the particle to move. So the particle is in the center at the bottom. Let's say I, the, part, the particle is at the bottom, it has zero kinetic energy. And I want to charge the particle, particle with energy. So I'm gonna do work, okay? So in order to do work, I have to work against that conservative force. I have to push against the conservative force. Well, you can see that this conservative force is smaller here than here. So the counter force, the conservative force is, 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 is larger here because there's a larger uh, derivative than here. So I'm gonna be fighting that conservative force almost like as if I push the particle up the hill. And once I let go, the particle will immediately accelerate as if it's running down the hill. So there is this kind of a hill intuition uh, that, that you can also uh, fall back on, at least in the one dimensional motion. Let me give you another example. Let's say I give you a potential energy graph that looks like this and what could this possibly mean well it depends on the energy um i mean no no what what this could possibly mean is a good question but what the particle would do it depends on the energy um when i look at this graph i see aha uh -huh, this is a bistable bistable situation why bistable? Because there are two equilibrium points. Okay, so you see you have two equilibrium points. You have two equilibrium points. And if I give the particle some finite energy and I let go, such a particle will shuttle back and forth between these two turning points. Right, so if I place the particle in the left potential energy well, I move it off the equilibrium and, and I let go, it will oscillate around that equilibrium. If I place the particle in the right well, okay, I move it a little bit off, the, off, off that equilibrium point and let's say I give it some energy, right? I do a little bit of work on it and I let go, okay? So I 
bring it to this point, I charge it with potential energy. Uh, I bring it to this point, I charge it with potential energy and I let go. It starts to oscillate back and forth. Or what I could do, instead of charging it with potential energy, I can charge it with kinetic energy. I can place it at the equilibrium point, I can give it a kick and it will move until it run, runs out of kinetic energy and you will know how much kinetic energy I gave it, I gave it based on how far it gets, right? Because at this point, at, the, at, the, uh, at this point, at the right turning point, uh, all of the kinetic energy has been converted to potential energy, right? And so you can tell how far it gets, you can find delta U, and so from that information, you know how, fa how, how fast the particle was, was kicked off of the equilibrium point. Okay, and it will oscillate back and forth. Okay. Or I could, for example, place a particle here, charge it with a lot more energy and let go, or I could give it a much bigger kick so it gets to that point. And then the part, what, the, what would the particle do? So this is E1, this is E2, this is E3. What would the particle do if its energy is E3? Visualize, visualize that motion. So it accelerates, accelerates, it reaches the right equilibrium point. That's it, where it's fastest because it has the largest kinetic energy. And then it continues moving because it has kinetic energy. You could say because it has inertia. And then it will slow down, but it will not quite stop. So at this bottleneck, it will, it's almost, again, it's almost like going up the hill, but you have enough kinetic energy to surmount the hill. Again, the particle is moving in one dimension here. So what it's going to do is going to go accelerate, slow down, pass the bottleneck, and then accelerate again. And then it comes to rest here, turns around, accelerates, slows down, comes to, passes through, squeaks through the bottleneck, and then accelerates, and so on. This can represent uh, a buckled ruler or a buckled beam, right? So what this could physically represent buckled buckled uh, buckled uh, some some sort of a buckled um, elastic object right so uh, so imagine you you can have a a ruler one of those plastic rulers that you can buckle and it reaches an equilibrium point or it has another equilibrium point because it can buckle in the other way so this is your equilibrium one, this is your, so this is equilibrium one, and this is equilibrium two. So imagine you take the ruler, you buckle it, it's bent, and then you give it a little kick and it will oscillate boom, 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 around that equilibrium point. Rulers have extremely high damping, right? But you can have a, an object without damping, right? Some, some sort of a elastic object that buckles. So it can oscillate around this equilibrium point or around this equilibrium point. And if you give it enough kinetic energy, it will go from one buckled state to, to another, right? So this could represent something like that. It could also represent something uh, more interesting, some kind of a physical situation. Do you guys know what an optical trap is? Optical trap, have you heard of an optical trap? So this could describe a, 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 a little, a biological specimen like a cell in an optical trap that, that, that's bistable, bi right? So a cell can be stuck here or stuck here. If you don't know what an optical trap is, then, then I guess don't worry about it. This could also represent uh, some kind of a, a molecule, right? You can have sort of some kind of a molecule, all right? So you can have a molecule that has either this configuration or this configuration, almost like cis or trans kind of thing, right? So this is a triatomic molecule. So this, the left one is an is an equilibrium configuration. The right one is an equilibrium configuration. Now getting from one equilibrium to another requires work. So if if the particle stays at equilibrium, you have to apply an external force that will be acting against this restoring force that tries to restore the molecule back to equilibrium. You have to fight, 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 reach the bottleneck, and then it will just fall into the other equilibrium. 
So you see, potential energies are really rich. They contain a lot of information. And, well, I got uh, carried away a little bit. My point is you, it would really help if you have intuition about potential energy. So your next homework has a couple of homework exercises about potential energies because it doesn't make sense to do quantum mechanics if you don't have any sense of what the particle would do classically, right? So we can talk about a mass on a spring, a harmonic oscillator. You have to have a sense of what the harmonic oscillator does classically before you can make sense of what it does quantum mechanically, quantum harmonic oscillator.